Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, we're looking together into the Word of God to discover truth. As you are reading the Bible or, and or as you come across a verse that is troublesome, why don't you call in and ask about it? We'll talk about it together and um, perhaps God will lead us into more truth as we do so. I learn from you the character of your question and I trust that you will learn from me as we uh, share uh, what, uh, uh, as we look at that verse together. This is that the nature of this program. And uh, so tonight we want you to feel free to call. Just ask one question. We have lots of people trying to call. And please call only once a month because, again, we have lots of people that are trying to get their question in. And so shall we take our first caller tonight, please. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes, welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, Mr. Um, Mr. Canty, I, I asked you this question. I tried to get you a qu question last time about three months ago, and you hung up on me. And I'd like to uh, uh, read. Uh, have you read John six fifty four and fifty five? John six verse fifty four and fifty five. Let's look at that. John six. Verse 54 and 55. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Now, what is your question? Uh, my first of all is on John six, uh, John one fourteen states. Um, John the word was one, made flesh. John one. Let's look at John one fourteen. John one. 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, what is your question? Uh, the question is this word eating. Now, it's 114 says that the Word of God is Jesus' flesh. And uh, just, reading the, just reading God's Word isn't enough. You have to eat it. That's well, that's my problem because um, eating is providing nourishment. A lot of people read the Bible, but they don't eat the Word. This, this is food for the soul and nourishment. It says, yeah. "Those who believe, out of the body will come living water." And that's the person that has been eating the flesh, reading the Bible, well, trying to understand it. Well, let's ask the question: What does it mean? to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Uh, as we read this in John 6, it looks very, very physical. And uh, we often wonder, well, you know, when Jesus was hanging on the cross demonstrating how he made payment for our sins, there was blood running down his face because they had put a crown of thorns on his head. His back had been lacerated, and so there must have been blood running off uh, off the back and the disciples were there did they run up with a little cup and try to get a little bit of blood and drink it uh, of course not of course not Christ spoke in parables and uh, you know uh, when we eat something we eat it because we get our strength and our life from that if we stop eating we'll die We when we eat uh, meat and potatoes and all the other things we eat, we eat, and bread. We eat these things in order that we might continue to have life and strength. And that that is the spiritual meaning. We can only have spiritual life as we 
uh, uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that he made payment for our sins. If he has not made payment for our sins, we cannot have spiritual life. We, uh, but if he is our Savior, if God has saved us, then as we read the Bible or as we, uh, as we live in Christ, well, we will be, we will have eternal life. We will have spiritual life because of what Christ has done for us. And so it's not a physical activity on our part at all. It's a matter of waiting for salvation. When we become saved, when God is t- encouraging us to eat his flesh and drink his blood, it's a way of saying, uh, pray, pray, beg the Lord for salvation because only God can cause you to have spiritual life in Christ. You cannot do it by any action on your part at all. Like, for example, when we offer the, uh, throughout the church age, God commanded the, uh, the, uh, the Lord's table and the bread and the wine or the bread and the grape juice there represented the broken body of Christ and the shed blood but that did not give anybody spiritual life you could you could partake of that lord's table every day and not get any spiritual life from it it was a sign pointing to this fact that even as we ate that bread and got life got strength and life from that and drank that uh, whatever was in that cup whether grape juice or wine uh, and, and gain uh, physical strength from that. So we are to get our spiritual life, our spiritual strength, because God has saved us. Christ has saved us. And we have no way of making that happen. All we can do is pray. And it's everything that we can do. We can pray and beg God and and wait upon him and maybe God in his mercy as we plead with him maybe in his mercy will include also amongst those who have gotten spiritual life from the fact that Christ made payment for sin yes but isn't that the word eating also refer to one someone who is already saved he was the one who will understand because well, God it, did it, but then and it's not any work of His own. But well, yet, but yet, if He's eating it, it describes a saved person. Well, but the fact is, first of all, we have to have life, and that life comes from food, and the food is the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is totally the work of Christ. Now, once we're a child of God, once we're saved, then we know that the keeping of the law, which is called uh, spiritual work, uh, will flow from our life. We will grow in grace. We will, we will uh, uh, become more and more obedient. We will trust God more and more. And that will develop also as from the Word of God. But bear in mind, bear in mind, there are lots of people who become saved who have with their ears have heard the word of God they have had no understanding in their heart because they're, they were only a year old when they became saved and, and they died when they were a year and a half old they never did have any, any uh, uh, conscious uh, reading of the word of God that they could identify with but yet they have eaten of the word of God they have eaten of his flesh and drunk of his blood drank of his blood because God himself applied that word to their life. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. You cut me off again last month, man. You wouldn't allow me to, and you read the wrong text, and you turned my volume off so I couldn't even respond to you. You always sabotage my calls, man. I asked to make a statement, and I have a question, and you wouldn't even allow me to make the question. Excuse me. I apologize if I cut you off. It was not intentional. I'm sorry, but now you are back on the air, and do you have a question? And I'll try not to cut you off. 
say that Osama bin Laden can call the Lord Father, didn't you? Yes or no? Didn't you say that? I'm sorry, did I say which? Osama bin Laden can call the Lord Father. Which means... Did I, did I say that? I never yes, you said, said You said the I unbelievers. Knew. You said it's the un unbelievers. Once, first of all, remember this, that in one sense, every human being is this is a child of God in a creation sense because we all began with Adam and Adam was conceived was uh, <coughs> was uh, 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 born in in the image and likeness of God uh, we start with Adam and and we all come from Adam and if Adam is our great 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 grandfather and he came from God then we came from God because we came from Adam. And so, uh, in that sense, we call him our father. But on the other hand, uh, when we are talking about salvation, only the true believers can call, are, 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 will call God father. But remember that uh, whether we're really saved or not does not depend on what we what we we can there are all kinds of people who truly believe they're saved and are not at all, and yet they pray our Father who aren't in heaven, and uh, it's not altogether wrong because uh, in a creations from a creation standpoint, God is their Father. Well, then what you are saying is this: what you listen to me carefully, the scripture that I gave you from Acts sixteen sixteen to eighteen. Look when like listen to me, I don't want to turn to it. Just listen to me. When that devil was preaching, he was preaching as to the servants of the Most High God that would show men the way of salvation. So you are saying, since that demon is speaking of God, just as Osama bin Laden and the religions of the world, you are serving that God. But that God is identified by name with Paul. And you refuse to acknowledge that his name is the Lord Jesus Christ, even though you see it in verse 18. Jesus said it in John 14, 6. And when I gave you John 14, 6 and Philippians 2, 9 to 11, you make a comment on verse 11 and run away with speaking something that I never quoted. But I want you to, I'm going to read... I want you to read Philippians 2, 8 to 11. Well, the, let's first of all look at Acts chapter 16. Uh, there we read in verse 16, It came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination. In other words, she was filled with evil spirits, with the devil, as you are indicating. And she is following Paul and crying out, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, these evil spirits are trying to look like they are children of God, or that they have a right uh, uh, relationship with God. And Paul is, uh, is aware of the fact, God has, con has given him the fact, that they are filled with evil spirits. And so he tells them uh, to come out of her, that he doesn't want this to happen, because we don't want, the, we know that the devil tries to pretend that he uh, has the right gospel. That's why we read in Second Corinthians chapter 11 that Satan comes as an angel of light. In other words, he comes looking just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, and we don't want anything to do with that. God warns us that this is the character of the churches in our day because Satan is ruling there. But now well, you we want us to look at Philippians 2, 8 to 11, and we'll see if that bears on this subject. Let me, let me read 8 to 11 to you. You didn't even answer the question. The emphasis Paul was making is on his name, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he was speaking there. You, you didn't even respond to the question. But listen to verse 8 to 11. I am, I'm being... I, uh, excuse me, I'm trying to go there. Well, I want to read it. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. 
And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, what is your... Please tell them, tell us, what is your question? Because this question is what we is, want to try to get to. What is your question? The question is in verse 9. He, the Lord God, gave himself a name that is higher, highly exalted him, and gave him a name which is above every name. So all the names that you assume that is God's name is not true at all. Because there's only one name, there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby they may be saved than the name of the Lord Jesus. That's what is in recorded in when he says... Uh, 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 excuse me, you know when we look at the Old Testament we see the name Jehovah over 7,000 times. We see the name Lord of Hosts. We see uh, the, uh, many names. And uh, when God is talking about his name, he is talking about every, uh, uh, the very essence of God. Like when we, we read in Matthew 28, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the, uh, that is into the very essence of God. Uh, God does not, uh, the, Jesus is a name that shows that he's the Savior. Christ is the name that he takes to show that he's the anointed one. He has the name truth because he is the way, the truth, and the life. He has the name uh, faithful because he is the faithful one who made payment for our sins. God uh, chooses many names to talk about himself in order that we might have a little bit larger understanding of who God is, of who uh, the greatness of, of God, the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ, because Christ is eternal God in every sense of the word. But thank you so much for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, I'm making this call in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, I'm sorry, or did we just have you on the air? No, you didn't. I'm making this call in the name of the Lord Jesus. Yes. Prophet. And I thank God and the Father by him. Now I'd like you to look up Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Matthew 5. Verse 7, uh, what is, uh, let's look at that, and then I'm going to ask you what your question is. And this is the nature of this program. Please, just state your question after I read this verse. Matthew 5, verse 7, there we read, uh, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, what is your question? Now, in the name of the Lord Jesus, since Jesus spoke in parables, I'd like for you to give us the spiritual meaning and use the whole Bible, and I'll take my answer off the air. Well, the, well, the, the, the fact that your question is, give us the meaning of this verse. And the meaning of this verse is, is that uh, where Christ is saying, blessed are the merciful, Christ is the very essence of mercy. We find it again and again and again, how merciful he is, how loving, how uh, patient, how kind, all kinds of wonderful uh, uh, things about the Lord Jesus. And if you, I would suggest you read Nehemiah chapter 9, Nehemiah chapter 9, and and there God gives a whole outline of how patient, how merciful he was with ancient Israel as he took them out of, it, out of Egypt and how they rebelled again and again. And yet constantly he was merciful. And, uh, and because he is so merciful, 
we too, we who claim to be believers, have to walk very merciful. We, uh, Christ has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, neither should we have a, any pleasure in the death of the wicked. We, uh, we wish, we wish, we are, should be praying that those who deserve the wrath of God, that somehow God in his mercy might still save them. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome, Open Forum. Thank you, Mr. Camping. Um, my question is about the angel Gabriel. Uh, would you and, be kind um, enough to turn yes, your radio down? Yes, I'm sorry. Down? It's off. Okay. Thank you. Um, could you explain to me who the angel Gabriel is? And then I have a question. Yeah, well, the angel Gabriel is uh, is actually I uh, not uh, the name of an angel. There isn't any name of any name angel in the Bible at all. The word angel is the word that in the is is also translated messenger. Anytime you see the word angel, think of it. Now, wait a minute. Is this an angel that God has in view or a messenger? Because God is the chief messenger and human beings are messengers. And depending on the context, we, we uh, have to t find out whether it's talking about an angel, is it talking about Christ, or is it talking about some human being? Now, when it talks okay. about the angel Gabriel coming to... Uh, yes, to, so the um, context uh, is uh, that um, I've it, been talking to a lot of Muslims lately, and they have told me that it was the angel Gabriel that gave their prophet Muhammad the message. So uh, in talking to them, you know, about the Bible, I want to be very clear, uh, you know, when they tell me that it was the angel Gabriel, and to them... It seems the ones that talk to me, they're very convinced that this was definitely a message from God and that it's to be respected. So how can I answer that to them? Yeah, well, uh, you, uh, you know, the problem of understanding the Bible, God has to open our spiritual eyes. And we try to share with others in our love for them. We try to share as best we can what we understand from the Bible, but we always have to keep our expectations very, very low because unless God opens their spiritual eyes, they will not understand, no matter how plain we might try to make it. And uh, we're just thankful, for example, that Islamic people, that they uh, also are talking about God. God, they call God Allah. That's an Aramaic uh, a translation of uh, the word that in our language we translate as God. It's, uh, if we look at the book of Daniel, for example, again and again it has the word God, and yet when we look at the aromatic letters that make up that name, we find that it could also be un uh, translated, uh, that it, and it is in the Aramaic language as Allah. Uh, so, uh, uh, but the fact is that uh, unless we tr finally come to the point where we trust the Bible alone and only the Bible and in its entirety as the Word of God, even though we may have many uh, truths of the Bible accurately, we still don't have the we don't have the truth of salvation. Only God can give that. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Welcome uh, to Open Forum. Um, I, uh, I have a question regarding, like you mentioned in your advertisements about homosexuality, that God, you know, in the last days that we're living, that he has uh, perpetuated this, uh, the gay movement. My, my question is this. I always hear that people say that are not say that are not of the elect that uh, they're born that way. They don't choose to be gay. Do you have any evidence from the Bible, studying the 50 years of studying the Bible, that that they're not born that way? That they that homosexuality is a chosen way of life. Well, the fact is that every human being, me, you, everyone, are born with a sinful nation, nature, a sinful nature. And in our sinful nature, we're capable of, do, 
of any kind of sin, including homosexuality or whatever. Uh, God, in his mercy, does uh, uh, keep us out of certain kinds of sins uh, so that uh, the whole world doesn't go completely berserk. If God gives them up, then sin magnifies. But when we get to this point in our life, uh, when we're right near the end, God says some very, very terrible things. He says in in uh, uh, Romans chapter 1, he's talking about the human race of our day. The context shows that. And he says in verse 21 of Romans 1, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Uh, we think, for example, of the way mankind talks about this world. There's millions of life forms, and we dare to say, all kinds of people dare to say, oh, no, God had nothing to do with that. That, had, that just came through, that evolved through time. It's, an, it's a ridiculous idea when we see how complex each of these life forms are. It's absolutely would require a, an infinitely great mind to design this and to make this. And yet man in his arrogance uh, try to tell God, oh no, you had nothing at all to do with this. And uh, with that kind of thinking, God is saying, when they knew God, verse 21, because deep in their hearts, uh, they know there is a God. They, uh, that's why they try so hard to be a, be a, an atheist because they they know they have to answer to God and and they and they'd rather uh, try to figure out a way where they can really believe that there is no God and so it says because I'm reading verse 21 of Romans 1 because that when they knew God they glorified Him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened that is God begins. Uh, to take whatever spiritual light they might have away from them. And uh, he says, And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. In other words, this world became uh, their God rather than the God of the Bible. Hold on, I'll finish this right after this message. We have a caller on the line who's uh, raised the issue of homosexuality, which we're reading uh, or we're learning quite a bit about, or it's a very active kind of an action that's going on in the world today, and it seems like it's it's really uh, becoming more and more acceptable as a, as a way of life, and and yet, what does God have to say about it? Why is it happening this way today? It's never been in the history of the world as popular and as well as accepted as a way of life as in our day. And God very, very clearly demonstrates why. God shows that this great, right, great rise in uh, homosexuality that also leads to same-sex marriages and it's, and it's increasing in every country of the world is a sign, a dramatic sign that God has raised up to show that we're right near the end. We were reading from Romans chapter 1, and, and God is saying, because mankind has become so rebellious, uh, effectively he is saying that, he says in verse 24 of Romans 1, wherefore God also gave them up. Now, uh, that is, he delivered them over. He delivered, it's like, it's like saying you've been delivered uh, to the judge to be tried and to be found guilty. You've been delivered to be put into prison. You've been uh, delivered to be killed. You've been delivered. This is what this gave, uh, this business of giving them up. It means to be, uh, to be delivered up and uh, in, uh, onto something. And what is it? Wherefore also gave them up or delivered them to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the Creator more than God, the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this God, for this cause, 
God gave them up. Again, the same word. They delivered them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the, the natural use under which it is against, which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves uh, the recompense of their error, which was, uh, which they, which was meat, that is, which they deserve. And then it goes on to give more than 20 more very gri gri grievous sins <clears throat> that would become more and more common at this time. And now we wonder, well, what, why did God do that? And we go back to Jude, verse 7. And there it talks about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And when we look at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah about 4,000 years ago, we find that the big sin that was in evidence was that they were very, very uh, involved with homosexuality. Uh, when very, very important visitors came to, uh, to visit Lot, to tell him that Judgment Day was about to come on Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the people, the men, all the men of the of Sodom and Gomorrah were were yelling and uh, trying to tear down the door uh, to have those men so that they might know them, and that's biblical language of having uh, a sexual relationship with them. And God picks up that in Jude chapter seven, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. That's another way of speaking of homosexuality. Are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. In other words, God uses the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as a portrait, as a picture of Judgment Day. When, and the big sin that was uh, uh, in evidence in Sodom and Gomorrah, because that very night, the Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, completely destroyed by fire. And that was a picture of ju or Judgment Day that's coming. And the big sin that's in evidence on that day before they were destroyed was homosexuality. And so God effectively is, uh, is saying here, or not, he is saying, this is an example of, of eternal fire. That is, of, of uh, being destroyed forevermore. And not in a fire that burns forevermore, but that you, are, you, you yourself are eternally destroyed. And so uh, when we tie that into Romans chapter 1, which we have read, we see that God in his mercy has, uh, has uh, uh, given, delivered people over, has allowed this particular sin to develop without any restraint of any kind. God delivered them up to some homosexuality as a sign that we're right on the threshold of Judgment Day. It is an awesome sign. There are other signs uh, that God also gave that showed we're very close to Judgment Day. But this also is a very dramatic sign. And so we don't have to... Uh, we know why it's happening. Why, why suddenly in these last uh, few decades that homosexuality has grown so, so rapidly and is so well accepted in so many uh, parts of the world and in so many societies way more than ever before. It is because God has raised this or allowed this to happen, has delivered mankind over to this so that it would be a sign that we're a warning to the world Judgment Day is almost here. But thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Brother Camping. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Um, yes, I'd like you to uh, please read uh, James chapter 2, verse 26, and then I have a question for you. 
Yes, let's read that. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 26. There we read. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, what is your question? Well, you, you said many times that, um, according from Galatians, there you say, work of faith. So then, wouldn't faith by itself be a dead work? Wouldn't faith by itself be a dead work? Yes, for the well, body with spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Well, you see, this is, we have to look at the context. If I say I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet my lifestyle shows that indeed I am not a child of God, I, I don't have an intense desire to be obedient to God because the work of God or to do works that is pleasing to God is means to be obedient to the law of God. And so if I claim that I'm a child of God, I have faith in him, and that doesn't show up, then that, that means I do not have faith. That's the context here. But the fact is that faith itself is a work, and, and it's not this particular aspect of the gospel is not emphasized here. But the fact is that I, it's my faith can never save me or assist me in my say salvation because uh, uh, faith is work and only after I'm saved after God has made me his child then then I can begin to do good works including showing faith and and and, and believing in the in the Lord Jesus Christ even further yes but you need to start with faith in order to have the works and that's why Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come in to him and he will meet. Yeah, but the faith that we have to start with, you're correct. We have to start with faith, but it's not my faith. That's the, the big difference. It oh, is we, the faith of but, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we don't like that. We don't no. like that. We try to get away from that because we somehow... In our humanness, we want we want credit. We want to be in charge in some way, and it's very uncomfortable for us, by nature and the nature that we have, that we have no control of any kind in becoming saved. It depends 100 percent on the action of God whether we're going to become saved, and we do not like that. I mean, if you want to ask, ask him, ask food, where the food, God, or that food. And also, what um, does it mean when God says that, um, <laughs> sorry, it could be lukewarm or cold? He says, if you're warm, I will spill you, I will spill you out of my mouth. Oh, well. Uh, that now we have a different question altogether, and we really should just stick to you know, our plan because otherwise we're unfair to others, and and so that, okay, that's an interesting question. Without. But why don't you uh, call maybe another month from now, and we'll look at that question. But the fact is that if Christ has saved us, it's His faith. That's why. Uh, Galatians 2.16 is one of the best verses that help us to see that, knowing that a man is not justified, and justified to be justified means to become saved, is not justified by the works of the law. And to have faith is a work of the law. It is being obedient to Christ. God commands us to believe. And that, so believing is a work of the law. But here is God is saying, we're not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Our faith can never, never make us 
right with God, justify us, that is, make us safe. That's an impossibility uh, uh, because uh, God's declaration that all the work was done by Christ. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Yes, go ahead. Hello? Yes, my question is, does God have to follow the Bible, what he wrote? Oh, absolutely. The, the God does not have two sets, two kinds of laws. The, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. It is the law of God. And everything in the Bible uh, that uh, we have to obey, God has to obey. And that is, gives us wonderful assurance because when we read about whatever we read in God's law, we know that it applies to God just as well as to us. So he has to follow the laws of days and years and, and time? Uh, the law, well, he is the one who, remember now, the, the law of God was established by God. Uh, God is the one who set the timeline of history and has put it in the Bible and veiled language very frequently. But, but, but he, as he opens our spiritual eyes, we're able to dig this out. And we know that this came from the Bible. God gives us proofs from the Bible, and therefore it means that it absolutely will happen in accordance with what the Bible teaches, because God can't have two plans. He can have, cannot have one plan that is developed in the Bible and, and then have a, a plan that is counter to that. That, uh, that is not possible. The God has to follow the Bible. Did he write about that in, in maybe Psalms? The book of Psalms where he can't break his law? Where he can't break his law? Does he say anything about that? Yeah. Well, that's the nature of the whole Bible, that, uh, that the Bible is the law of God. And that's what gives us, gives us confidence and gives us uh, a, 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 a wonderful certainty that uh, what, if we understand the law of God, God will keep his law. When he makes a promise, for example, we know that if we have understood the promise accurately, it is absolutely going to happen. And God gives us all kinds of illustrations. As he, for example, uh, in his law declared that Jesus, when he came to demonstrate uh, how he would be our, had become our Savior, would be born in Bethlehem. Uh, and he uh, described how uh, that he would be born of, a, he would receive a human uh, body of human nature from a virgin, from someone who is not, uh, not already, uh, had not already uh, born other children, and so on. And all of these things will uh, take place be exactly the way God has prophesied it. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you, Mr. Camping. Uh, yes, I uh, just wanted to say, first of all, I, I read your work. Uh, we are almost there, and I, I think that's brilliant. Uh, the other thing, you know, hey, I have an idea. Considering that we are less than eight months away from the day, how about if we, uh, in, because of the sense of urgency, we could increase the number of questions to two? Well, but um, we can an idea, but, but the, the, I understand. Just an idea, but Mr. Camping, does the Bible tell us anything specifically about the uh, the final eight months? Does no, it, it doesn't. It, yeah, yeah, I understand your question. Uh, we okay. wonder: Are we going to have any anything that? Uh, uh, some action in the, like with floods or with earthquakes or, or uh, with uh, volcanoes or, or anything in the natural world that would tell us that we're getting closer to the end. I, ha I know nothing of that in the Bible. But God has given us 
dramatic signs that show us we're close to the end, and they will continue to develop with greater urgency, like the sign of, of the gay pride movement. That is a, a sign that shows us that we're right at the threshold of Judgment Day. It doesn't give us the date. We have other information in the Bible that gives us the very precise date. Or again, God indicates there will come a time when uh, when uh, there will be many people who are saying Christ is coming as a thief in the night. We can't know the day. And yet they are convinced they are a child of God. And then sudden destruction will come upon them. And that sign is in evidence everywhere where there is a church, uh, a congregation, uh, where... Uh, they are trying to still use the Bible as their authority, yet they are insisting, no way can we know Christ is coming as a thief in the night. And uh, invariably they will also indicate, but we are a church of saved people, and we are not worried about that. And they fit precisely into the sign that is indicated in First Thessalonians chapter 5. And so we have some of these signs that indicate we're right at the end, but they're all spiritual in nature, you'll notice. They're not, they don't have anything to do with, with the uh, physical universe. Uh, there's, there's, uh, I, I, I don't, at this point in time, I've not found anything in the Bible that is pointing to uh, disturbances in the physical world that would that would in indicate we're right near the end. Now, there may be those coming, but uh, I'm not aware of where the Bible shows that. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. If you pray for me, Harry now is in California. Pray for me, Harry in California. Pray for me, Harry now is in California. Yeah, we w w can't take that call because this is not a... We certainly w know that there are lots and lots of people that would like to be prayed for. And you know, the wonderful thing is that anybody can begin to pray and have entrance into the throne room of God. How can that be? How can that be? That's the gracious mercy of God. But we come there very humbly we don't come insisting, we don't come yelling at God, or we, we come begging, beseeching God. And, uh, and we know God hears us, whether, and we also know whatever happens is God's perfect plan. And that's the nature of a true believer more and more, or uh, uh, that is that we are completely desirous that only God's perfect will might be done. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, um, question for you. It says in the Bible, I'm not really familiar with the Bible, it says that God says that um, you're cold or you're hot, and if you're lukewarm, he'll spill you out of his mouth. What, what does he mean by that? Well, the, the, either cold or hot, you know, is talking about that in Revelation, uh, about the church at La Laodicea, that ye are neither hot nor cold. Now, the word hot there means that we have uh, a zeal, a zeal uh, for the word of God. We are zealous that we are as obedient as possible. And if we're not hot, it means that we are we are uh, we don't have any zeal we're lukewarm we we're, we're just kind of getting along but that is not the nature of a true believer a true believer or a congregation that's really a congregation of true believers there's going to be an intense zeal to be as faithful as possible to the word of god to be cold is means that we have it's it's identified with the water cool water uh, and uh, uh, God frequently uses that word "cold" as a as a synonym for uh, for uh, really becoming uh, intensely involved with the gospel, which is called the water of the word. And uh, it is. Uh, uh, and if you're neither cold nor hot, it means that you're not zealous for Christ, nor are you that excited about the 
word of God or the gospel of God, you are lukewarm. You're just kind of, kind of uh, 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 claiming to be a, a church of Christ or a person that loves the Lord. When actually, no, that isn't the nature of a true, a true uh, uh, believer. A true believer or a church that's really on fire for the Lord. Uh, is, is there that, is great is zeal there and a great concern for the truthfulness of the Word of God. And uh, uh, that's why in the church it said there in the, about the church of Laodicea, I will vomit you out because you are, that's the kind of evidence when you're neither cold nor hot, you don't have zeal and you don't have that much concern for the faithfulness to the Word of God. It, uh, uh, you are you are simply playing games with this whole business of salvation. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Good evening, Harold. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Um, could you please read Ezekiel fourteen, verse fourteen? Let's look at that, Ezekiel. Chapter 14, verse 14, there we read, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord Jehovah. Now, uh, uh, let me let me start with verse 13 to get a little more con con uh, con context. context. Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, and will break the staff of bread thereof, and will send famine upon it. In other words, I will take the true gospel away from them, and will cut off man and beast from it. And, and then he says, even though these three men, and he names three men that were uh, wonderful examples of what a true believer ought to be, uh, Noah, Daniel, and Job. And even though they were there, that there you had some believers of this nature, it would not save uh, that congregation or that group of people because as a whole group, uh, except for these three, they are in rebellion against God and God's judgment is going to come. Oh, okay, because the way I read it, it, it sounded like that uh, Daniel, Job, and Noah were saved by their own righteousness, and I was going to ask if this was translated properly. Oh, but the fact, uh, yes, it, 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 their righteousness is, is righteousness that we know from the right. Remember, every verse we read has to be read in the light of the whole Bible. When we do become saved... God, we do have a, a righteousness that belongs to us now. It was, didn't come because of what we did. It's because God gave us a new, our new eternal soul in preparation for being with Christ forevermore. It's like when we read uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, that which is born of God cannot sin. That is, that person has a righteousness about him that is different than the righteousness of any unsaved person, but it was given to him by God. It had nothing to do with his action of becoming righteous. It was the gift of God. It all, it's, goes with salvation, and that is the righteousness that is displayed by these three men. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hiya. Yes, welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Harold. I'm calling in regards to Matthew chapter 24, please. Yes, and what, what verse? Uh, verse 21. Verse 21. Well, let's look at that. Matthew 24, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor ever shall be. And what is your question? 
My question is, is this in reference to chapter uh, 24 in regards to where Jesus Christ is speaking in the end times concerning the uh, wars, rumors of wars, uh, pestilence, and uh, various things that are to take place in the end times? Uh, is no, this, no, is, no. That, when he talks about wars and pestilences, that is that is common to this world at any time in its history that is not in itself in any way a signal for the end there's never been a time when there aren't wars and pestilences of various kind but when he's talking about this tribulation it is this time when it which began in 1988 and think of it for the first 2300 days Virtually nobody in the whole world became saved. Satan had been installed, freshly installed, to rule in the churches and also to rule in the world. And so it was a bad, bad time to begin. Continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to open forum. Hi, Harold. Good evening. Uh, I wanted to... Uh, yes, go ahead up. with your call. Yeah, good evening. Um, uh, I wanted to follow up on your discussion about uh, and what you published about uh, the gay pride sign as an end time sign. Uh, yeah. My very my very specific question is, and I'm not sure I've heard you uh, address this topic, is after Judgment Day, is the Lord going to restrain sin? Uh, will God restrain? No. When Judgment Day comes, sin, there is no more salvation, no more mercy, no more gospel uh, of the mercy of God at all. The whole world will be in a horrible situation of, of death and bodies that have been thrown out of the graves and people who die and no one to bury them. And it'll... And, and through the 153 days of Judgment Day, that whole period being called the Lake of Fire because God is a consuming fire. And it, uh, that whole time will be a horrible time for planet Earth and uh, there's no hope for it of any kind and death everywhere because the wages of sin is death and, uh, and God putting his shame on all those who have uh, who have uh, sinned and not been saved, they'll, be, they'll be, be thrown out of their tombs and be like, the Bible uses this ugly language, they'll be like manure on the ground and uh, it's going to be just a horrible time. And that is, that is Judgment Day. It has nothing to do with any restraint of sin. It's, uh, it, it's just a time of, of visitation of the wrath of God. Thank you. And thank you for calling in, Shari. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Campion. How are you tonight? Yeah. Hello? Very well. Yes. And what is your question? Yes. I just wanted to take you to um, James uh, Chapter 2, verse 23, I have three verses that actually um, relate to the same thing. So, you're, you're, and then after that, I'll ask my question. Now, let's focus on one question, and we read in James chapter 2, James chapter 2, verse 23, we read, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now, that okay. particular verse is repeated several times that Abraham well, believed God, and well, it was to... counted unto him for righteousness. Now, what is your question? Okay, now we go to the second one, which is Galatians 3, 6, and then I have one more verse, and then I will point out something and ask my question. Galatians chapter 3, verse uh -huh. 6. As Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Okay. Same and statement. Romans 4, uh, uh, chapter 4, Romans, verse 3. Romans 4, verse 3. There we read, 
Romans 4, verse 3. Uh, and what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It's, as I okay. indicated, uh, that no, no, hold phrase hold is hold found on. in several places. Now, what is your okay. question? It says, basically, that if you read um, the next verse, um, it says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of a debt. What that means, basically, is it's a debt if you work. But if you believe, which is faith, then it is reckoned, which is given. The grace is actually given uh, uh, as a belief uh, uh, in the uh, uh, faith. Excuse me. And if me. you read 4 uh, and 5, uh, it explains ex itself. Uh, please, excuse me. What is your sure. question? Your, is your, well, your, and let me, uh, you're asking really for an explanation of this verse, and let me... Indicate. No, 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 that's not what I'm asking. The verse explains itself in excuse verse me. 4 and Excuse five. me, it does not explain itself. It does not explain itself. It is one of the difficult verses uh, that uh, uh, is contrary to what we've just been looking at, for example, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, because believing is work. And this verse is saying as it stands here, and if we're going to use it as a proof text for whatever we believe, and all kinds of people do so, uh, they are being led astray because the translators did not understand what God was saying. The word it, uh, by in accordance with the nature of the Greek language, could e just as easily be translated he. And he was counted uh, for righteousness. Who is he? We know it cannot be Abraham. Abraham, uh, faith is work. And therefore, it's impossible that the way that verse stands, uh, that it is teaching truth. It is impossible. It is not in, in harmony with uh, everything else the Bible teaches. But once we... Uh, uh, correct the translator. We're not correcting the original language. We're correcting the translator. It should have been written this way. For Abraham believed God, and he, and that he is God, was counted unto him for righteousness. Now we have complete harmony with verses like, uh, uh, Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 because believing is work as we read in in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 uh, the, the, this verse is not self-explanatory the way it is it is it is a it is leading all kinds of people astray and it has led all kinds of people astray and uh, and uh, but now that God has opened our spiritual eyes really the truth we have learned that it it cannot be it. It has to be he, and that's perfectly uh, agreeable to the original Greek language. And now it fits its total harmony. God was accounted to us, to him and to each one of us who become safe for righteousness. It was his faith that by, by which we became saved. And... Uh -huh. One quick point. Um, if you read four and five, Romans um, chapter four, verse four, and verses five, and then you also read verse twenty-four. Well, let's... They very clearly define what that verse three means. It's very clear. It says, "To him that works, performs the work, is not reckoned, but of grace. If you work, then it's a debt." But it was granted to, to Abraham, which means Abraham's faith, which is faith that was developed in believing God, because he was actually, he left, he was yeah, sent from his homeland, um, if, believing but, God, went and did what he was supposed to do. And if you go through 4 and 5, Romans 4, 4, 4 and Romans 4, 5, and Romans 4, 24. It yes, excuse exactly me, Ex excuse me. Now let's look at Romans 4, 24. There it says, But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, that is, faith shall be uh, 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 given, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. If we believe. Now, 
we have to stop right there wait a minute how am I going to understand this because believing is a work that that uh, and we cannot be saved by works but we still have to believe uh, like uh, like the jailer of Philippi was told when he was asking the question how can I become saved believe on the Lord Jesus Christ but I can't believe because I'm it, that's a work that has to be done and, and I can't be saved by works how am I going to believe well it's simply very simple God makes me believe he gives me uh, uh, the, uh, a new heart so that I, I now can as a result of salvation I will believe uh, but the believing uh, that is, uh, which is really akin to salvation. If we believe, if we become saved, that God has to m do the saving. But we like it the other way, because if it means that it's my faith, well, then I'm in charge. I can decide when I really want to become saved. I can start believing, and and. Uh, how in the world is that figure when all of the payment for sin was before Christ ever created the world? And, and I, I, I wasn't living back then. Uh, when I received my, my eternal soul, do, what did I have to do with that? Uh, that? Because that's what happens when we become saved. We're given a, an eternal soul. That's the reason that when a believer dies, he, his body is put in the grave, but in his soul... He goes to be with Christ, like uh, Lazarus in the in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. And uh, but how can that be? I I I can't believe on him. I, I'm I'm spiritually dead. Uh, that's a work. I, there's no way that I can do work that is pleasing to God. God has to make me believe. He has to save me. And now. Good works will flow from my life. I will continue to believe and look for the completion of my salvation and so on. But I, I, the moment, the, if we're, uh, I'll tell you, this is a very serious matter we're talking about. It's very serious because the Bible warns that if you are trusting in any sense, in any work that you have done, any work, even a tiny bit of work, it guarantees that you are not saved. You're going to come under the wrath of God. This is clearly proven in the Bible. And, and that's why uh, this is such a serious question. And it has been it's so sad that, uh, that uh, this has been translated this way. God allowed it for his own purposes to stand that way. But it certainly uh, was uh, not translated correctly. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yes, hello, Mr. Kennedy. I got just more of a comment that, that, that in Romans 4, just listening about the faith, it, I totally agree. You have, I'm, and I'll just make this quite short. It's just, there's a verse in Romans 4 where it says, He did not waver through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving God glory. The Greek construct in that verse is a passive verb. So it's clear if you read it in the Greek that it's God who gave Abraham the faith in that verse. So I just wanted to add that. That, that verse didn't do enough studying on that Romans 4. He's telling you to study Romans 4. So I just wanted to say that. But thank you. Continue on, Harold. And may God bless you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Um, yes, good evening, Brother Camping. Um, I believe that the Lord has saved me. And I, and, and also that uh, May 21st, 2011 is Judgment Day. But I, I'm, I'm afraid of that when that day comes. Is, is that understandable? But I am afraid of what? Of, 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 of that day, May 21st, 2011. Even though I, I, I believe the Lord has saved me, and I do believe that May 21st, 2011 is Judgment Day, I still have a, a, a fear of that day. Is that, is that understandable? 
Well, yes. I, I don't know whether you're a child of God or not, but uh, we all uh, should have a fear of God. That, uh, uh, that uh, because in fact, the Bible talks about that's the nature of a child of God that he fears God, and and that fear is not uh, not that I'm afraid that I'm going to still be destroyed by God in Judgment Day, but I fear that I'm that I might do sin. That that. I have a hatred for sin. I want only to do the will of God, and if I, and and it certainly is not a wrong thing if we're not altogether sure of my of my salvation. And so I fear. Oh, wouldn't it be terrible if I would enter into that? Uh, and that's the wonder of what God allows us to do: to pray and pray and beg and beseech and implore. God, oh God, could it be that I, that I will uh, be thy child? And I know it depends entirely on your action, but yet I tremble when I think about Judgment Day coming, and I only, I, 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 I just want to trust in you more and more, and and wait, I wait upon you that hopefully I will not be entering into that Judgment Day. And uh, we can we can question our salvation and be absolutely truly saved. That doesn't that that or just because we are truly saved doesn't mean that we can uh, be. Uh, uh, and sometimes we can be fairly certain about it, as Romans eight verse fifteen or sixteen teaches. But on the other hand, uh, we may not necessarily. And there's nothing bad about constantly going to the Lord for reassurance. Well, thank you so much, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hello, Brother Camping. Yeah, would you be kind enough to turn your radio yes, off? Yes, I just did. I'm sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to know, um, uh, do your doctrines... Um, reflect the official teaching of family radio yes this is what we are we are uh, what what we are teaching on the open forum is what family radio believes to be true now that doesn't mean that every employee of family radio believes these things that we don't call, ask that question of our employees as long as they are faithful employees but we do know that when we're going to teach uh, uh, from Family Radio, whoever is doing the teaching, they we have to have we have to speak with one voice. It has to be a clear trumpet sound. It cannot be uh, uh, one person is teaching one thing and someone else is teaching something else. We want to have, speak with one with uh, one voice because truth is only uh, one. It is not two or three uh, different ideas. Well, I've also, um, I've listened to uh, uh, Craig Hulsebus, and um, it's been a few years since I listened to this message. Um, and he was, I, I, I can't remember the specific doctrine that he was dealing with or teaching. Now, excuse but, me, uh, excuse me, excuse me. what you're teaching. Excuse me, we, I don't want to talk about any personalities, please. But it is true that we have announcers, for example, that are that go to churches where they don't hold these doctrines like we do, and of course an announcer is uh, he's faithful to his congregation, and we don't we don't say he can't be there at all, uh, but sometimes that will slip into their statements when they are doing a program. Uh, they don't mean it with malice of forethought. They're not consciously really trying to teach something contrary. But it's just the, that's the way they normally speak. Uh, and, uh, and so that can slip in. And we try to catch those slips wherever possible and edit them out. And, uh, but we're not perfect about it. But uh, insofar as consciously teaching, we, we, uh, uh, and uh, and our announcers are not teachers. They are simply trying to ca ca make the program continue in a in a in a spiritual, uh, uh, godly way. Uh, but they can make a slip now and then. 
but it is not done with malice of forethought or, or consciously trying to, to teach something different than what, uh, what uh, the Bible, or than, than what uh, the policy of family radio is. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take shall our we? next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Harold. Yes, go Can ahead you with me? your call. Yes, go ahead. Hey, uh, you know, uh, I learned more about my soul in a couple of studies in family radio in the last two years than I ever did in a church. And it appears that uh, that's overlooked every time they want to debate about faith and who gave it and, and the word it and the word he. Uh, but, you know, I think the fact is that when we're born from the womb, we have a dead soul that can't cry to God, that can't seek after God, and no matter what the flesh looks like it's doing, that's doing no good. It, we have to have that new resurrected soul that converses in an unknown language with God. That's what seeks after God, and it draws the flesh then at that point to have that flesh. And, and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm wondering if when you get into not a debate, but somebody has a different opinion there, why we, we don't have a study to inform people. I even want more information from family radio through the teaching uh, programs on the radio uh, to understand that even more, because I, I know that's critical. Uh, there, wow. it, is a, it is an absolute facet of salvation, what the soul is and what it does before it's saved and after it's saved, that also is a cause of how we believe body and soul, just not the words that comes out of the fleshly mouth. Yeah, well, it, you know, the fact is that uh, we, uh, are, we have Bible studies going on constantly on family radio, but the gospel is so broad and there's so much to teach uh, that uh, we, uh, we, and we're trying to teach as much Bible as possible, as accurately as possible. And so sometimes we don't cover a subject as intensely as we, as someone might think we ought to. But if you keep listen long, listening long enough, we will get into that again and and again. And so uh, we are we are doing our best to be faithful to the Word of God. But I'll tell you this: there isn't one of us think that thinks we are doing it perfectly. We are praying oh. constantly that God will guide us so that it will be pleasing to him as much as possible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you, Mr. Camping. I've heard a quote um, that says, God will never give you more than you can handle. And I've heard that so often, and I'm just curious, is it quoted from Scripture? Uh, yes, there is a verse that teaches something like that. I don't know, I don't remember exactly where it is, and so I can't really comment about it. I, I don't like to comp comment about uh, something that we understand God teaches if we, uh, if we don't have the ver some verses right in front of us. So I'm sorry I won't okay. be able to com comment on that. I appreciate that. I was hoping you might know where it was. Thank you very much, though. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call is 1-800-322-5385. one 5385 And shall we take our next call, please? Brother Camping. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Uh, real quick, for your last caller, I think it's First John five verse eleven and twelve was uh, God shall not put us up under more than we can bear. Um, there's something along those lines. But uh, what I wanted to call and talk to you about was uh, I think there's just a, a small issue of splitting hairs over salvation and works, and I think the I think the issue comes down to. To me, the entire Bible, if I had to sum up the entire Bible in one word, it would be repent. Um, he, he preaches that, you know, God is righteous and we're not. And over and over in Judges, when they were unrighteous, they received judgment. And when they turned from their wicked ways, 
uh, things would go better for them. And if we go to the people of Nineveh, you know, God was going to destroy them and sent Jonah to teach them to repent. And, w- and when they did repent, they were saved. So I think the issue is repentance. And where I'm going with this is you teach that salvation is not of works, but is of God, and nothing we can do can earn salvation. And I think you're correct there, but I think it's important to add that um, in order to attain salvation from God, we have to, as a work, repent and uh, to receive me. that salvation from God. Uh, we have to repent. Now, we don't uh, actually do anything to save. We're not doing any of the saving. Christ but, did all of the uh, saving. Excuse me. Excuse me. Repent is work. You are correct. It is an uh, uh, obedience to the law of God. We are commanded to repent. But no work that we can, that we do, no uh, obedience to the law of God can be a contributor to our salvation. That we can uh, have, uh, we could be a drunkard, we can be, uh, uh, do a lot of ugly things, and we can repent of all those things that will never, never make a contribution toward our salvation. The only time that we uh, that we repent is we remember God has to do all the work, and when He gives us our new eternal soul, uh, which is what occurs when we become saved, then there will be God's repentance in our life because in our new soul we never want to sin again. That is the repentance. That God is saying you've got to repent and be washed of your sins and so on. It's when God gives us repentance, we ourselves can never, never uh, repent sufficiently uh, to become saved because that is a work that we do. And the, and the biblical rule of Galatians 2.16 holds true of any work, whether it's repentance or believing or loving or patience, or any kind of uh, activity in which we're trying to obey the law of God. None of that can make any contribution of any kind to our salvation. Well, I, I, I'm not in disagreement with that, but I think the issue is just a matter of we have to take the step and, and, and say we repent. Otherwise, there is no reason for us to do anything. Pretty much anybody can just exist and allow the work of God to save them in the end. Excuse me. Excuse me. We do not have to take the step. Uh, if we're, if we're going to put any trust that we have taken the step, that means that we're trusting in a work that we're doing that made a contribution toward our salvation. We cannot do anything. Can that little baby that's six months old, can they repent? Can that baby repent? Can that baby become saved? Absolutely, yes. But now I have to say good night.